So for those of you who have not yet had a chance to meet me, I'm Dr. Erin Kolodzie, one of the other interns at the clinic, and tonight it is my pleasure to speak to you on the hot topics that we have in equine medicine. So looking at an outline of the topics I'll be speaking about tonight, I will start with the disease update on West Nile and equine infectious anemia and how this relates to Alberta. Then I will move into four joint products, Noltrex, Foresight, Cardiflex, and Flexidin, some of which Dr. Petilla did speak about <coughs> earlier. And then last I'll speak about wound management and the use of calcium, algae, and AMD the clinic is currently using to manage wounds. So first, I thought moving into West Nile would be a good idea to remind everyone on the transmission of the West Nile disease. And birds are the reservoir for West Nile, but it's actually the mosquitoes that feed on these infected birds and then become the carriers and transmit this disease to both people and horses. So as I mentioned, West Nile is spread to horses through mosquitoes. And this disease leads to the rapid inflammation of the brain and neurological clinical signs. The clinical signs associated with disease are listed here, but many of these signs are not specific to West Nile, making it sometimes difficult to immediately identify. However, if we do see any horses with these signs, West Nile is one of the differentials that we have to think about. So West Nile is one of those diseases where any horse can be affected of any breed, of any age, of any sex. And horses who become severely affected can actually die with a mortality rate of 15 to 39 percent, with the most serious cases being in horses who become recumbent during this disease. This disease is challenging as there is no specific treatment, and we have to treat the signs with the use of anti-inflammatory drugs. Supportive care such as fluids, nutrition, and sling support, and those horses that do recover may take weeks to months to do so. So bringing this to Alberta and the relevance in Alberta, we have currently had 55 cases reported in Alberta this year as of September. This map here shows the reported cases, with the most cases taking place in Alberta, and, or sorry, in August and September. And the red dots on the map here are the confirmed positive cases, which are mainly in southern Alberta. And it's important to note that most of these cases are in unvaccinated horses. So moving to our next slide here, we want to look at how can we prevent and control this disease in our horses. And the two main ways to do this is through vaccination and mosquito control. So with vaccines, we recommend vaccinating horses every year in the spring before the mosquito season hits. And if horses miss a year of vaccination, we do recommend that when they are next vaccinated, they also be boosted. And this will help to ensure the optimal effectiveness of the vaccines. It's important to note that vaccines do not always prevent disease, but will reduce the severity of clinical signs and the chances of your horses potentially dying. Another critical factor for West Nile is mosquito control, and this comes in reducing the breeding sites of mosquitoes, such as minimizing standing water in your property, making sure that you decrease exposure to mosquitoes, such as bringing your horses in at night, you want screened housing and fans if possible, and the application of bug spray, especially over the underside of the belly, as that is often forgotten. It's important to note that West Nile infects mules, donkeys, and horses. It is a provincially notifiable disease in Alberta, and humans can also be susceptible to this disease. Moving on to our next virus is the equine infectious anemia virus. And this virus is a persistent and incurable viral disease to which all equines are susceptible. It's spread by blood, milk, and bodily secretions, with the biting insects the culprit this time most often being stable flies, horse flies, and deer flies, as well as contaminated blood products, such as through needles, blood transfusions, or tattoo materials. It can also be spread through the saliva and shared bits between horses. It's important to note that infected animals are infected for life, and clinical disease is often associated with high levels of the virus in the blood. However, no combination of the clinical signs, as listed here, can say for sure that your horse has equine infectious anemia, and many infected horses exhibit mild and apparent disease, but are still able to infect other horses. So these symptoms listed here are generic, making equine infectious anemia difficult to diagnose, and many horses are subclinical carriers, never showing us any signs, but still, shedding this, but still able to transmit this virus to other horses, which makes it a big concern. So with equine infectious anemia, many of you are familiar with the Coggins test, which is the test that we use to look for carriers for this disease. This test looks at antibodies in the blood, and the identification of positive animals unfortunately has to lead to euthanasia. There is 
talk about how you can quarantine animals, but these animals need to be quarantined for life and have absolutely zero exposure to any insect, which is next to impossible. So to protect other horses in the area, these horses need to be euthanized. So bringing this back to Alberta, this year we have had eight cases of equine infectious anemia that have been reported. This map shows the areas in the province, with two cases in the Strathcona and Sturgeon counties. One case in Grand Prairie, Bonneville, and the Clearwater County. So again, we want to look at how can we try to protect our horses from equine infectious anemia. And unfortunately, with this disease, there is no vaccine available and no treatment. Therefore, we need to take precautions to reduce the risk of infection. This comes in controlling and minimizing exposure to biting insects, the Coggins test, and it's recommended that animal testing is performed, and at the time of pre-purchase exams of new horses, they have a Coggins test. New horses to properties should be isolated until they have been tested for and proven to have a negative Coggins test. And it's important to practice strict hygiene protocols. So this includes trying to minimize blood contamination, so do not share needles between horses, and make sure that if you have any questions, to always consult your veterinarian, as they'll be able to tell with regarding testing questions, high-risk areas, and how to best protect your horse if you have any questions. So, changing gears now and moving away from infectious diseases, the next portion of this talk will look at some of the newer joint support products that we have. And like Dr. Patilla mentioned earlier in her talk, horses and the fact that they are so active and exercise quite often leads to the wear and tear in their joints. This leads to inflammation, which then leads to pain and the physical breakdown of cartilage and joint disease and lameness. In the early stages of inflammation, you have the inflammation of the joint capsule, but over time, this leads to cartilage degeneration and osteoarthritis. So we have nutritional and intraarticular management that is used to help decrease inflammation in the joint, slow joint degeneration, and alleviate pain. And the four products that I'll be talking about are listed here, some of which Dr. Patilla did also already mention. So the first product of Intrix is Miltrex, and this is a synthetic joint lubricant in the form of a polyacrylamide hydrogel. So this means that it acts as a substitute for a compromised synovial fluid, at least in the mechanical protection of the joint. Miltrex has lubrication and cushioning functions similar to that of hyaluronic acid. However, studies have found that it does not degrade over time and thus lasts longer, up to two years in some horses, but again, we're still figuring that out ourselves in clinical practice as it's not been around that long in our clinic. And the injection in the joint is where the child, sorry, Miltrex is injected in the joint and it's a supplement for retarding or slowing cartilage degeneration. It delays the development of post-traumatic osteoarthritis and improves the lubrication in joints suffering from osteoarthritis and thus the resulting pain that comes with it. So Miltrex is a good option for early stages of osteoarthritis treatment and more advanced cases. Our next product is Foresight and this is a nutritional supplement option that supports joint function. It has a list of ingredients here whose role is to include chondrocyte proliferation and thus the regeneration of cartilage. It controls inflammatory mediators in the joint. It supports healthy synovial joint fluid and cartilage health and acts as an antioxidant to further protect the chondrocytes, which are the component of cartilage. Now the next slide. So Foresight as a nutritional supplement can not only be fed as a preventative, but it can also be used to delay the onset of osteoarthritis as well as to support joint function after horses have undergone surgery in the joint, in horses that have moderate to severe forms of arthritis, and in horses that feel a bit off or stiff. Different levels are recommended to be fed for different cases, such as if you're using it for maintenance versus horses with poor joint function or those that have had surgery on the joint, and it's a good idea to consult with your veterinarian to determine the proper amounts to feed the supplement. And foresight can be used in conjunction with other therapies to treat and manage arthritis in the horse, or as a supplement to aid in maintaining healthy joints. Our next product is Cardiflex, and this is a product that is recommended for active horses that are currently in work and training programs. Again, the list of ingredients is here, and these ingredients serve to act as anti-inflammatories and protect the joint. They slow the oxidation damage caused in joints with inflammation, slow the aging process of cells, and reduce overall inflammation. And this product leads to overall healthy joint support recommended in horses that do not yet have any signs of advanced arthritis. Our 
final joint product is Flexidin, and this product enhances the body's normal repair of cartilage and joints. The ingredients listed here have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. They help to make collagen and glucosamine and support overall bone and joint health. Flexidin maintains joint mobility and flexibility. It supports the structural integrity of the joints and promotes the healthy inflammatory response in joints. And this product is used to support lasting joint mobility and support for horses with known problems in a joint. And then changing gears once more, we will look at the new bandaging layers for wound management in the forms of calcium algae and AMD bandaging. And I will discuss the benefits as to why we like to use them in our wounds. So horses, it's challenging with them when they have a wound because they do not always form an adequate inflammatory response at the site of the wound. And you need this response in order to bring in good things to help heal the wound and to take away infection and damaged cell and tissues. So calcium algae comes in as a contact layer that can go directly on the wound with no ointments needed. It promotes granulation tissue and wound contraction to make the wound smaller by promoting an inflammatory response at the site of the wound. Thus it leads to a granulation bed filling in the wound. It's important to differentiate that excessive granulation tissue, as we know as proud flesh, is something that we do not want. However, we do need a healthy bed of granulation tissue to fill large wounds before we can have healing and this is where calcium alginate comes into place. And other benefits of calcium alginate is the high calcium, con high calcium concentrations help lead to wound contraction. This makes the wound smaller and helps it to heal faster. It can also be placed directly on exposed bone sometimes, and the bone that the veterinarian has curated to minimize the clustering formation. Once wounds have a healthy bed of granulation tissue, we can discontinue the use of calcium alginate. And a special feature with this product is you can leave it in place for up to five to seven days on a wound, as long as the bandage is clean and dry, there's no strike through, it has not slipped as it is often on leg wounds, and there's no significant change in lateness. And our last product is AMD, or the antimicrobial foam dressings. And these AMD pads are semi-occlusive foams that help to finish the healing of a wound. This foam increases the surface temperature of a wound by a couple degrees, leading to the body being able to select for epithelialization, which is new skin growth, at this temperature. It is again not recommended to add any other substances to the wound during the epithelialization process. The AMD foam provides the right surface tension for the advancing skin edges, it limits bacterial growth on the wound, and inhibits the amount of proud flesh that is produced. It is best to use this once the wound has granulated in well and we begin to have skin edges advancing in from the wound. This can also be left in place for up to five days. Again, as long as the, band as long as the bandage remains clean, there's no strike through, no changes in lameness, and similar to that is the calcium alginate. And with these products, it is important to work with your veterinarian during the healing process of wounds to determine the right stages to use them, the right product, and to identify complications that may arise quickly before things become harder to deal with. And in light of Halloween, I figured the Halloween cartoon is fading, and I'll open the floor up to any questions. Because the West Nile is also a human disease, how many cases of West Nile in humans did we have this year? And do you have a similar map showing us where they are? <laughs> that is an excellent question, and I do not know the answer to that but I could look it up for you if you would like, as I'm sure with this many cases in horses, we do have an increasing number in humans as well. Why is there a vaccine for horses, but yet there's no vaccine for humans? That is another very good question that I do not have the answer to. The amount of regulations they have to get here to get a vaccine licensed in humans. So Dr. Cantillo mentioned that one of the reasons is the amount of regulations that you have to go through on the human side of medicine to approve vaccines and improve their safety and efficacy. I've heard that there's an increased incidence of uh, rabies um, in central Alberta. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> I personally do not, but I'll ask the senior veterinarians if they're aware of that. I know there has been increasing incidence in areas in the states. Not in horses. Yeah, I think there's been increased incidence in like bats and, and other animals in Alberta in the last year or two, but I don't think there's been any cases in horses. Okay. 
enjoy treatments. Mm -hmm. Which one would you recommend? So the question is, out of the joint treatments, which one would I recommend? I repeated the question, Marge. Right? Saw the look. And it really depends on the horse and if you have any sorts of existing joint disease or if you want to use it more as a preventative to delay the onset of osteoarthritis. So it really depends on the stage of the horse and what they're being used for and where they are with their joint health. Still in the hot seat, yeah? Oh, Dr. Burwash. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Google uh, human cases of West Nile and Alberta. There's 50 this year, uh, seven in the Calgary area. The vast majority of them, 40 of them are in southern Alberta. So a total of 50, which is a great injury. <laughs> Thank you for that. And so again, Southern Alberta is the hot spot right now for West Nile, both humans and horses.